Welcome to lecture 11, which deals with mobile radio propagation, specifically outdoor propagation models. Let us look at the outline of today's lecture. We will start by summarizing what we have learnt already in the previous lectures. We will then discuss log normal shadowing in greater detail. We will look at an example to explain how we calculate the different parameters related to log normal shadowing. We will also see how to find out the path loss exponent n and sigma. Then we look at another interesting parameter called the outage probability, which is important for cell site planners. The other important thing to learn is what is the percentage of coverage area? That is, how many users can actually be covered with your base station placement? Can we calculate it? Can we predict that? We would look at that. And then we will have a brief introduction to outdoor propagation models. So, as you can see, today's lecture is geared towards outdoor measurement and estimation of how much area we can cover and what is the probability of outage as well as what are the other possible propagation models. First, let us begin with a brief recap. We started off last time by looking at the free space propagation model, the freeze free space model and we realized that the inverse square law holds provided you are not taking any ground reflections. Then we looked at small scale propagation model which actually takes into consideration the reflection, diffraction and scattering effects. Then we looked at large scale propagation model which primarily works on the basis of reflection only. Then we came up primarily based on empirical data that log distance path model actually fits well for the path loss model. However, the log distance path loss model is deterministic. It does not take into consideration the shadowing effects. So, what signal you actually receive is a, a random variable and it depends on where actually you are sitting, whether you are in a shadow of a building or are you being scattered well enough or things like that. Therefore, you have to have some kind of a random variable built into your equation so as to model the log normal shadowing better. So, we start with this log distance path loss model. We remember that the average large scale path loss for an arbitrary transmitter to receiver separation is expressed as a function of the distance by simply using n the path loss exponent. We learnt last time that this n can go from 2 to even 6 depending upon how dense your environment is. In fact, we looked at a special case where n was less than 2, the free space path loss exponent in line of sight inside room scenarios where the hallways inside buildings can give you a guiding effect. So, it is better than 2. However, n which characterizes the propagation environment usually is 2 for free space and when obstructions are present that is no line of sight, you have a larger value of n. Today, we will look at some examples to find out how to calculate n from measured data. We came up with the following two equations. One was a proportionality that the path loss at a distance d can be expressed in terms of a path loss at a known distance d0. Remember, this equation holds true only in the far field. This value of d0 is also measured in the far field, n is the path loss exponent. Usually, it is comfortable to express the whole thing in db as explained here. So, just to summarize this equation, this will form the starting point. P L bar denotes the average. If you remember, the actual measured data fluctuates about a mean. The fluctuations are important, but what really characterizes the path loss is the average value. 
Hence, this PL bar denotes the average large scale path loss at a distance t. You have this d0 as your reference distance. When we do an example, we will make sure how to use this d. And of course, PL d0 is computed using free space propagation model. That is different. So, this equation is mix and match where PL d0 has been computed using a free space model where n is actually equal to 2. It can be measured or calculated, usually calculated and the rest of it assumes a value of n which may be larger than 2. Let us go back to log normal shadowing. Why do we need log normal shadowing? To take into account the shadowing effects due to cluttering on the propagation path, a factor has to be added. And how is it added? Well, we have our same P L path loss average at a distance d plus this factor x subscript sigma. In the terms of your P L d 0 with respect to a reference difference, the P L d at a distance d is nothing but the path loss measured at d 0 plus 10 n log d over d 0 plus x sigma. x sigma is interesting because it is a 0 mean Gaussian random variable in d b with a standard deviation sigma which is also in d b. So, please remember that this n and sigma are usually calculated using measured data. So, how do we determine n and sigma? In practice, the values of n and sigma are computed from measured data using linear regression. So, that is we take some measured data, but somehow we have to do some kind of a curve fitting. Now, there are many ways to fit a curve. What is done is we use something called as a minimizing mean square error. So, the difference between the measured data and the estimated path losses are minimized in a mean square error sense MMSE. Let us look at an example. So, the scenario is as follows. I am interested in modeling a suburban environment where I have a transmitter and I have a receiver with a car and a power meter. So, what I do is I measure the values of the received power as I move along and I do not take just one measurement. In fact, I take tens of measurements, average them and find out the average received power. The first step must be to find out the reference power at a certain distance. So, let us begin. Let the distance d 0 be 100 meters. So, I move away from the base station at about 100 meters. Remember, this 100 meters is from antenna to antenna, not from the base of the base station to the receiver. So, here suppose I get 1 milliwatt of received power, which is nothing but 0 dBm. If you remember, dBm is nothing but the relative power with respect to 1 milliwatt. Now, as we move along radially away from the base stations, I keep on taking measurements and I tabulate it. So, just for the sake of illustration only, I take 4 measurements in all, one at the reference distance and one at 500 meters, 1000 meters and about 3 kilometers. At each of these points, using my power meter, I have obtained the following readings. In reality, if I have to really measure distances up to 3 kilometers, I would take more than 20 measurements here. Okay. So, what do we have to do now? We have to somehow fit our measured data in the best possible manner in the mean square error sense into this equation. Okay. So, 
since your PR D0, the reference distance is 0 dBm, my equation PL dB is equal to PL D0 plus 10 N log D over D0 simply reduces to PL dB is 10 N log D over D0. Now, this equation may be used to compute the estimated power levels for a certain value of n. I know the value of d0, I know the value of d because I have three more entries in my table. I can have a sequence of numbers of n. So, let us do that. So, I have another column in my table now, where for every distance corresponding to the every measured power, I have an estimated value. Now, the first row is 0 of course, because it is based on the d0 itself, but rest of the three entries have to be a function of n. The question before us is what value of n to choose, so that these three points best fit this curve. So, the next step is to calculate the mean square error between the estimated which is this column and the measured which is this column. The objective is to choose a value of n such that the mean square error is maximized, sorry minimized. So, let us look at the mean square error first. Mean square error is defined as under root summation from i is equal to 1 through k, where k is the total number of measured data points, p i the measured data, p i hat which is the estimated data squared. So, let us look at it. This inter inside the parenthesis is the error part squared this is the averaging part and this under root is taken. In our case, we go by the measured value and the estimated value squared. So, in the first case it is 0. If you go back to your first equation, here there is no error between the measured value and the estimated value. However, next time this is the measured value of minus 5 dBm, this is the estimated value, measured, estimated, measured, estimated, square it. So, we have mean square error. Please note as expected, the MSE is a function of n. Now, what do we have to do? Minimize it. So, the best way to minimize is of course, to take a simple derivative. If you have the luxury to plot the data, you can plot the data with respect to different values of n and you know the n can vary from 2 to 6 and find out the value of n for which MSE is minimum. So, you have got two ways to do it. So, either you take a derivative or you do a plot. So, if we plot the mean square error with respect to n, the minimum point is reached close to 2.4. So, for this specific set of data points, the path loss exponent is 2.4, which means it is kind of an urban scenario, but not densely populated urban area. We do not have very many concrete buildings here, otherwise n would have been 3 or larger, but clearly it is not free space there are a few obstructions, foliage, little bit of scattering and things like that. But it is a good estimate, because your mean square error is fairly close to 0. Now, what do we do with this? We have got a handle on your n, the path loss exponent. If I had taken a larger set of measurements, yes, then my error would be larger, the minimum error would also be larger. It all depends upon the total number of uh, data points to take and how easy or difficult it is to fit the curve. Now, let us focus our attention on the sigma part. What is the sigma part? Sigma is the standard deviation. 
Now, the sample variance sigma squared is defined as in the numerator summation i is equal to 1 through k, where k is the total number of measured data points. For our case, it was 4 p i minus p i hat, where p i is the actual measured power, p i hat is the estimate of the power at that distance d, predicted from our equation squared whole divided by k, where k is the number of measured samples. Okay. So, it is a measure of your variance, the sample variance. From this and if you remember your mean square error equation in the last slide, your sample variance sigma squared is equal to mean square error for that value n which minimizes the MSE. So, if capital N represents that value of path loss exponent that minimizes the mean square error, that minimum value of that mean square error divided by k is sigma square. This is obtained simply by combining this equation and the equation for mean square error. It can also be represented as that minimum error divided by k and the sigma, which is your standard deviation is under root m m s c divided by k. So, here if the value of k is larger, then from the weak law of large numbers, your estimate of the value of sigma squared and hence sigma will be better. In practice, k is not 4, you can take 20 to 100 measurements. And remember, each of these measured points are averaged themselves. Okay. So, just to give you a feel, we are doing some in-house data measurements for ultra wide band frequencies from 3.1 to 10.6 gigahertz. We do the measurements in frequency domain, right? find out the HF, the transfer function and then take the inverse Fourier transform to get the impulse response of the channel. So, this measurement is not to measure the sigma squared but I am just talking from the perspective of channel measurements. We take about 1600 measurements for every point and then average it, but the channel is fast changing. It is a time variant channel that we are talking about. So, at every location we are taking close to 1600 measurements and then averaging it. Here we can average just 20 measurements or so at every point and so you can get p i by averaging say 20 measurements at a certain point. Okay. Averaging is very important because you have seen that there is a lot of fluctuations that take place. So, let us continue with our example. We have this nice relationship between sigma squared, the measured value, the estimated value and the number of measurements k. For our case, when n is 2.4, we substitute this value. So, our capital N is 2.4, which minimizes the mean square error. We get sigma squared as 3.11, which is very low, which is nothing but sigma equal to 1.76. If you remember the equation, sigma is also expressed in dB. So, you can take 10 log uh, sigma squared, which will give you the expression in dB. Now, what do we do? We enhance our log normal path loss model. What we do is a Gaussian random variable having a 0 mean and variance sigma squared can be added to the log distance path loss model to simulate the shadowing effects. Please remember shadowing is very important. Even if you are sitting in a cell fairly close to the base station, However, because of the shadowing effect, you may not get enough power. Whereas, a person sitting farther away from you may enjoy power more than the required threshold. That is because of the shadowing effect. It is a random variable. In fact, that will help us determine the coverage. Not all points in the cell are covered because of the shadowing effect. you may be closer to the base station, still enjoy less power as opposed to somebody who is farther away from the base station. 
Let us now look at something called outage probability. What we would like to know is what is the probability that the receiver power which is denoted by P r d at a distance d of course, measured in d b at a distance d is above or conversely below some fixed value gamma. Now, let us understand the objective behind the statement. We have fixed a threshold value gamma. Now, the threshold value can be fixed because of several reasons. Either my receiver sensitivity dictates the gamma or in that particular application, my modulation scheme requires a certain signal strength. That is, if my level is below gamma, I will have to resort to a lower modulation scheme, which will lead to a lower system capacity in the overall sense. Okay. Or I might be prone to interference in the system and I need a certain signal strength level, so that I need to combat the effects of interference in an interference limited scenario. Again, my received strength should be greater than gamma. Otherwise, my system will fail because I am clobbered down by interference. All these reasons require me to find out somewhere how I can decide the probability that my received strength will be greater than this threshold gamma. Of course, if you are below the threshold, then you are out. We are trying to calculate the outage probability. So, we would like to know the probability that the received power at a distance d is greater than or equal to gamma or conversely less than or equal to gamma. Remember, these have to do something with your shadowing effect. Otherwise, based on a clearly deterministic situation, we cannot come up with these values. Now, for a normally distributed random variable x, we have probability that x is greater than a value x naught is equal to integration from x naught to infinity. This is your famous Gaussian random variable p d f 1 over sigma under root 2 pi e raise power minus x minus mu whole squared over 2 sigma squared d of x. Mu is the mean sigma in the standard deviation, sigma squared is the variance. If you know mu and sigma for a Gaussian random variable, you know everything about it. That is the beauty of the Gaussian PDF. It is one of the most favorite of all the uh, PDFs in communication engineering. So, for a normally distributed random variable, the probability that x is greater than x naught is given by this expression. Let us now look at an example of outage probability. Here, we have plotted the Gaussian random variables p d f. If you look on the x axis, I have plotted the received power. Now, clearly there is a mean, right. So, if you look at the mean, the average power is centered around here, but because of the shadowing effect, you may get some power below it or above it, fine. So, on the y axis is the probability and this bell shaped inverted bell is the p d f of the received power p r at a fixed distance t. Now, how broad is this? What is the sigma for this one will be determined by the measured data, if you remember. Now, this equation that x is less than x naught. So, I have reversed the situation here. I am trying to find out the probability for outage. Outage will occur when my received power is below a threshold. So, if my threshold is x 0, x naught here, the probability that 
the value of the receipt for x is less than x naught is equal to now minus infinity to x naught area under the curve. So, let us pick a value for the sake of illustration. Suppose I would like to have my p r greater than 3.3 d p for it to function well. So, what I do is I draw a line here. By now, you have already learnt that all the receipt power is always being expressed in dBs. So, I have drawn a line here and the area under the curve to the left of it represents the probability that the receipt power is less than 3.3 dB. So, whatever be the area under the curve value is the probability that you will have the outage. So, outage probability is given by the area shown by the shaded figure. So, you can easily find out. If instead of having 3.3 dB, my line was centered around the mean, then, then the outage probability is 0 0.5. Right? Clearly, if I improve my receiver sensitivity, that is my receiver is more and more um, sensitive to the received signal, that is I can work at lower received power. I move this yellow line to the left and left and left and my outage probability goes down. It is not linear, it changes exponentially. Question? Okay. The question being asked is as follows what is the relationship between this threshold value and the handoff threshold? So, the answer is yes, we would like to use this to design a system in such a way that if it drops below a certain threshold, you like to hand off. But the handoff should happen when truly you are in a shadowed region and not because of the random fluctuations. So, so far the whole theory is based on average power models. Yes, if it falls below this threshold, I would definitely like to hand off. Okay. So, it is possible, it is a probabilistic quantity that you are not moving, you are sitting at one location in the cell, but because of the random nature of the shadowing, some scatterers have moved, some cars have moved around or your environment has changed in such a manner that you are getting lesser power than your threshold, yes you would like to hand off. Another question? Sir, uh, this is also useful to find out the distance for the amplifier, like in the base uh, if you want to make some amplification. Yeah, the question being asked is what relationship does this threshold have with the design of the amplifier? So, the way people calculate it, it as follows. First of all, your outage probability is a selling feature. Your customer who is going to subscribe wants to know what is the coverage area, what is the probability of outage. They will not know in these terms, but there are some you know, buzzwords which can be told and you can claim that there is 99 percent coverage, which also factors into account the outage probability. So, the first thing that the service provider must understand is what is the outage probability the person has to guarantee. Once the outage probability is decided, your received average received power threshold is decided. Of course, it also depends on the cell sizes, the interference requirements and other effects. And then you fix what kind of a uh, amplifier you want to choose. However, Amplifier strength for standard handsets also come kind of fixed. Maybe a better receiver, a better handset, a more expensive handset might have a better amplification facility. It is possible, but in general, all you can play with as a, a service provider is to manage the size of the cell. Answer is we can change the amplifier, maybe we can go into a more expensive model and it will have lead to a better um, outage probability, 
but that has nothing to do with the service provider. The service provider is not selling you the handsets, but he is designing the cell for standard handsets available off the shelf. So, in that sense, he will have nothing to do with the amplifier. But if you improve your amplification, yes, your outage probability will go down. Okay. Um, so, a service provider should use this curve to actually plan the cell sizes and we will shortly look at an example to relate somehow these equations to the coverage area. What is the percentage of area within the cell that I can provide service to? That is another important feature. So, this outage probability can give you a sense as to the, the percentage of time that is the factor you can come up or the percentage of people who uh, will fall into the outage category. But a more um, realistic perspective is to find out the area, percentage area within the cell which is covered or which is not covered at a certain time. So, let us now focus our attention on the percentage of coverage area. Due to the random effects of shadowing, some areas within the coverage may be below a particular received signal threshold. Remember, my intention was good when I designed my cell. I ensured based on the average power measurements that everybody within the cell has enough power. Unfortunately, because of this random scattering effects shadowing, some people despite my calculation will be at a lower level. Is that point clear? So, even if I have designed my cell for average values, I still have people within the cell who do not receive enough power. It is useful to compute the percentage of coverage area. Please remember there is a Gaussian random variable that has been placed at the re average received power level and the Gaussian random variable extends to minus infinity on one side. So, no matter how much signal strength you pump into the cell, there will be a extremely low but non-zero percentage of area which is not being covered unless your sigma is 0. For a non-zero sigma, you will always have some fraction of the cell which is not being covered. Nonetheless, it could be very small. So, consider a circular coverage area for the sake of simplicity with a cell radius r from a base station and a minimum threshold power level gamma. So, let us draw it. I have a cell, I have put a base station here and the radius of the cell is r. What we do need to find out is to determine the percentage of area. Remember, the percentage of area where the received signal level is greater than or equal to gamma. So, we are trying to find out the 1 minus outage probability. I am looking at the optimistic perspective. What percentage of the cell is covered. The percentage area is given by P A gamma, clearly it will be a function of gamma. If I reduce my gamma, right, more and more area will be covered and vice versa. Is nothing but the probability that the received power is greater than gamma, the threshold D A integrated over the whole cell area normalized with respect to the entire cell area. So, the area which is covered divided by the total cell area. It is easier to express this in polar coordinates. So, I have this double integral 0 to 2 pi all around the cell, 0 to r. So, moving radially away from a certain cell section r dr d theta is a small area where the probability of receipt power is greater than gamma. So, that is my formulation. So, uh, if you notice this analysis is simplistic in the sense that I am only working for a circular cell. I can extend it for a hexagonal cell or a square cell by doing numerical integration. 
So, let us label this as equation number 1, we will use this equation to come up to the final expression. So, we note that the probability that the received power at a distance d right, greater than gamma is nothing but 1 by 2 minus half error function gamma minus p r d average over sigma under root 2. This comes from the Gaussian random variable, this is a standard result, it is the area under the curve in the Gaussian tail. Error function is defined as 1 over under root pi 0 to z e raise 1 minus x square d x. So, these expressions are coming because we have a normally distributed received power. Now, the path loss at a distance d which is given by p l d can be broken down into three parts. So, path loss from 0 to do 0 to d is path loss from 0 to d 0. What is our d 0? This is our reference distance. So, time and again my reference distance is popping up and hence the importance of a measured value plus the path loss d 0 to r minus path loss d to r. So, if you combine them together, so p l average d is nothing but p l average d 0 plus 10 n log r over d 0 plus 10 n log d over r. If you combine uh, equation 2 and 3 and do some basic mathematics, the probability p r greater than gamma or threshold can be expressed like this. Again, we do a little bit more mathematics. If you go back to your original equation, which finds out the area where your received power is greater than gamma, you get this expression where a and b are expressed as follows. b only depends on n and sigma. By now, we know how to calculate n and sigma by measured data. So, it is not difficult to calculate. a here depends on your threshold gamma, it has to depend, transmit power and your uh, n and sigma again. Now, once you simplify everything and when the dust settles, you get the final expression of the uh, percentage of area which will get the received power higher than the threshold gamma as this following expression. So, there are two ways to do use this expression, either you calculate n sigma, figure out what is the transmit power p t right, uh, and then substitute into this equation or you can plot a family of curves and quickly look at the parameters and find out what is the percentage of area. So, what are your parameters? Your parameters are that the probability that your received power is greater than some gamma, that is one probability. The other probability is the coverage area and then there are two parameters sigma and n. You can use something called as a normalized sigma over n variables. So, there are three parameters with which we can have a family of curves, which will capture the essence of this equation. So, to do this equation, let us plot the family of curves. Question? Yeah. ERF is error function. Error function has been defined previously as error function of z is nothing but 2 over under root pi 0 to z e raise power minus x square dx. This is a handy way to find out the area uh, under the curve of a Gaussian tail. This and a q function is sometimes used. In some textbook, you will find error function, uh, some textbooks you will find the q function and in some textbooks you will find the error function complement. They are all related to the area under the curve for the Gaussian 
random variable. So, going back to the family of curves, which will help us relate the coverage area sigma and n. So, here I have drawn some curves, let us look at the axes first. So, on the x axis I have tried to put a normalized value of sigma, sigma over n. Okay? I have not uh, separated out sigma and n, this is also done in literature. Please remember, if you have a small value of sigma, then you will have a larger and larger coverage area, because the randomness goes, what you designed for is what you get. On the y axis ordinate, I have put the fraction of the total cell area, where the signal is actually greater than threshold. So, it is my useful area, it is my selling feature as a service provider, the fraction of cell area, where the signal strength is better than the required threshold. So, 1 is the best possible scenario, 0 is bad. As you know, intuitively if you move towards the left on the x axis, that is we go for a lower value of sigma for the same n. If you go for a lower value of sigma for the same n, you move higher and higher up in terms of the fraction of area that you cover. This is intuitive, I have less randomness. On the other hand, if you fix the sigma, and you increase n. So, if you fix the sigma and if you increase n, this is hypothetical because sigma and n themselves are related as you saw in your previous calculation. But for example, if you fix sigma and increase n, then uh, um, you again move towards the left. Right? However, that is not a fair comparison because sigma itself will be a function of n. If there are more scatterers, n will go up and your sigma will also go. So, you cannot fix one with respect to the other. On this side, I have put probability that your received power is greater than gamma. Now, you, you would like to have the probability that your received power is always greater than threshold. You want to be absolutely sure in your cell design, then you are exactly at this top level. Not much can be done about your strict requirement. On the other hand, you say, okay, I want 90 percent of the time that my received power is greater than my threshold. So, 10 percent of the time you may drop your call. Then I am on a curve which is represented by 0 0.9, I move along this curve. If on the other hand, I am a service provider who is cutting corners and I said, no, look, uh, 75 percent is good enough, let 25 percent of the calls get dropped once in a while, because the receipt power exceeding the threshold value, right? that probability is only 0 0.75, then I move along this curve. Now, let us consider an example or continue with our previous example, where we calculated n is equal to 2.4 and sigma is equal to 1.76. Right? In this case, if you take a ratio, then this is close to 0 0.76. So, if you divide sigma 1.76 by 2.4, you are somewhere here. Suppose I say, look, I would like to work at a level where my probability required that my received power exceeds the required threshold be 0 0.6. This is a poor design but let us see where we are. Under this constraint, I would like to know what fraction of the cell area will be covered. Please note, I have not talked about how big my cell is. Okay? Those things are not coming into the picture. Then, if I follow this curve, I see that 93 percent of the people in the cell will have threshold the received power greater than the threshold with probability 
it's, it's a way to design your cellular system. Let us look at a slightly different scenario and uh, let us look at another set of values n is equal to 2 and sigma is equal to 4. So, I have moved more into the rural area instead of having 2.4 I am in more free space environment and sigma is 4. Right? So, under this situation I should um, basically this curve is for 4 it should be uh, possibly for sigma is equal to a value of 8 where I have sigma over n is equal to 4. So, let us go by this example, but for this set of parameters I should have moved somewhere along this line of 2. So, when the ratio of sigma to n is 4, so if we modify this example of sigma is equal to 8 and n is equal to 2, then we say look let us look at 0.7 as the probability that your received strength is greater than the threshold. So, I made my thing stricter. In that sense, I will have this time the percentage coverage only 87 percent. Typically, I would like to work over 95 percent coverage if I am going to make a viable system, economically viable system. But this family of curves gives you a very handy way to relate your n, your sigma, the probability that you want to give your uh, signal receive signal greater than a threshold and the coverage area. This is true for the circular derivation, cell being circular in nature. I can have another family of curves for hexagonal where I will calculate these values based on numerical integration. At this time, let us now look at certain outdoor propagation models. So, I would like to introduce the concepts today and in subsequent lectures look at the exact models. Depending on the coverage area, outdoor propagation envi environments may be divided into three broad categories. Category 1 is propagation in macro cells, we will describe what is a macro cell. The next is propagation in microcells and propagation is a specific subset of microcells called street microcells. Please note we are talking about outdoor propagation models. After this as we move inside indoors we have home cells and we also have pico cells within the home and also body cells where we have a body area network, but all those are much smaller. So, as you can guess these are in the decreasing sizes, large cells, smaller cells. What are macro cells? Here the base stations are located at high points on top of a tower, on top of a tower, on top of a building or on top of a tall building itself. The coverage could be of several kilometers. So, I am talking about a standard cellular mobile network. The average loss, the average path loss in dB has a normal distribution. This we have measured, seen, done examples with. So, these all are the characteristics of a macro cell. The average path loss is a result of many forward scatterings over a large number of obstacles each contributing a random multiplicative factor, hence the notion of fading. Converted to dB, this gives a sum of random variables. Thus, if you use the central limit theorem, sum is normally distributed. Hence, you have the average path loss in dB being distributed as normal, this is a characteristic of macro cells. As opposed to micro cells, the propagation differs significantly because you have a milder propagation characteristic, there are small multipath delay spread and shallow fading implying that the feasibility of higher data rate transmission. 
we have also seen before that as you grow into smaller and smaller cells, your data sending capacity increases. Mostly used in crowded urban environments. If the transmitter antenna is lower than the surrounding buildings, an interesting thing happens. The streets start forming guides. The waves tend to become guided along the streets. So, the signal actually propagate along the streets and it forms the street microcell. Okay. Now, many times you do not want your base stations to be very tall. Clearly, in macro cells, base stations must be as high as possible. As high as possible means more probability of line of sight to the receiver, less blockage. If you increase the base station height, less blockage. However, there are interesting scenarios when we do not want the base station height to be much higher. In fact, almost at the level of the receiver. This is because if you can communicate happily with the receiver in your cell or in your micro cell without the maximum height, then why increase the height? It will only cause interference to other base stations and other cells where the frequency is being reused. So, your base station height should be only as high as required, but not any higher, because you have a chance of sending out more interfering signals. So, by design, we may want to put the base stations not at very high locations, but that is by design. Okay, depends on what is your system. So, now let us look at the scenario of street microcells. Most of the signal power propagates along the streets. Uh, a, an analogy is inside your building, if you do measurements along long corridors and hallway, you have the similar effect. And in one of your earlier slides, you have seen that path loss exponent n can be less than 2 inside building, where you have a line of sight and corridors. The signal may reach with line of sight paths, if the receiver is along the same street or it may reach via an indirect propagation mechanism, if the receiver turns to another street. But the indirect mechanism could be sub scattering or reflection or even diffraction, but once the reflection or diffraction occurs, again you have the guiding effect. Let us look at this graphically. So, here is a bird's eye view of a densely populated urban area with lot of buildings. We have drawn them uniform, but it could be of irregular shapes and heights. Let A be a location of a transmitter and let C be the location of another transmitter denoted by red circles. Let B be the location of one of the receiver. So, the mobile station located at B easily gets access to either A or C, because of the great guiding effect of the streets. Note A and C are lower than the building heights. However, if B moves to D, then the signal must propagate along this line, it should diffract or scatter or reflect, then again go through the street guiding effect and reach D. This is a very funny kind of propagation. Where will it be useful? When you plan your base station locations for a dense urban environment, then you have to take into consideration the street effects and also the height of the base station your measurement data will also be different in this scenario. So, a slide on macro cells versus micro cells. The cell radius, as the name suggests, macro cells are larger as opposed to the micro cells. Macro cells can go from 1 kilometer to 20 kilometers. Of course, these days you never have cell sizes of 20 kilometers. Much before that, you either get interference limited or capacity limited, but we will still call them macro cells. If my cell 
is a footprint of a satellite. Remember, we are looking at wireless communications in general. Let us not think about only mobile systems as the only means of wireless communication. So, a footprint, a cell formed because of satellite communication might have a radius of 20 kilometers. Micro cells on the other hand are much smaller 0.1 kilometer to 1 kilometer. In 802.16, the IEEE standard 802.16 wireless MAN standard, the cell sizes are by definition in the micro cell region. Maximum you have 2 kilometer cells, so it is in between. Clearly, if your cell size is smaller, you require less transmit power. You should use only as much power as required and no more, because your power is interference for somebody else. Transmit power ranges from 1 to 10 watts, whereas sub watt 0.1 to 1 watt for micro cells. Fading characteristics will also be different. Here it is relay, clearly you do not have a line of sight. On the other hand, in micro cell the probability of line of sight is much larger, because you are closer to the base station and you can have a Rishian distribution or a Nagakami rise distribution. The delay spread depends on the multipath environment. If you have the reflectors far apart, you will have a larger delay spread, which is true for macro cells, with the delay spread could be 0.1 to 10 microseconds, as opposed to very low 10 to 100 nanoseconds for micro cells. If you are doing voice transmission, this delay spread might cause a problem. Delay spread will be looked at in greater detail later on, when we look at countermeasures for fading. Max bit rate also depends on the size of the cell, here we cannot go very much. However, for micro cells you can really go up to Mbps or even higher, actually this will be a function of the bandwidth allocated as well, these are token numbers. Fine. So, at this point, let us summarize what we have learned today. We started off with log normal shadowing and then we looked at an example to find out how to determine n and sigma based on measured value. We used the method of minimum mean squared error and we found out value of n and sigma. Then we looked at the definition of outish probability and went on to cover the percentage of coverage area, which is an important design parameter for base station allocation and cell site planning. Again, we realize that the percentage of coverage area depends on n, sigma and a threshold value. We also had an introduction to some outdoor propagation models. We will look at specific propagation models in subsequent lectures. Okay. Thank you for your attention.